start with a kind of chat so you're running there. Yeah. Asifa Lahore. Uh, I am transgender uh, and a trans woman. I also perform as Britain's first out Muslim drag queen. Uh, I love drag. And um, as part of that, what I do, I run LGBT club nights in, in London. Um, I also uh, DJ, sing, do cabaret shows, I do panel discussions. I really push the debate um, of being LGBT and Muslim, for example, and also the intersectionality around faith and uh, gender and sexuality. Um, my preferred uh, pronoun is she, her. my role at Dreamland is really trying to um, create opportunities, programs that engage with, um, for me, audiences that perhaps sometimes feel that Margate or Dreamland isn't for them. And um, that's primarily sort of young people. Um, I mean, it's a really broad range of different people from the community, but for me, it's really about giving those people the opportunity to have their voices heard um, and to feel included. Um, hello, my name is Jackie Hagen, and I'm a poet, um, playwright, stand up comedian, and sometimes I make weird shit that people don't know <laughs> what to call it. Um, <laughs> and um, I bang on about class a lot, and I make stuff. When I make something, I start with accessibility at the, the sort of the core of it, you know, rather than like tacking on a ramp or like a BSL interpreter on the side. It's like you think of it from the very core and like accessibility in the widest sense. Uh, yeah, clap. Um, hi everyone, my name is Roxanne Tatai and I am a musician from South London. Um, yeah, I songwrite, I sing, I perform and most recently, I guess a lot of my music has been focused around um, 
the human experience and me trying to navigate the spiritual and the human world. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> what about your pronoun? Sorry, and my pronoun is she, her. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Gemma Kearney. I'm probably partying with a lot of you in this room. <laughs> I live in Margate. Um, I, uh, I do loads of things. I like to try and weird shit as well. <laughs> but when I have to label it, I say that I have a triple pronged career as a founder of a production company called Boom Shakalaka, which is based here. Um, we work a lot with Brigitte Aphrodite, the icon of that is. Um, and I'm a published author, which I can hardly believe, and a broadcaster of 10 years. And I would say my pronoun is she, but again, it depends on how you feel, isn't it? Buzzword, um, but what we want to know uh, is, is it, is it surface? Is it all a bit surface? Um, where are we at? Where are we really at? Do you feel represented? Um, are we, what, is it, what does diversity mean to you? Are we cutting the mustard? So I'm just, who wants to kick me off? That was a lot of questions really. This is my first chair time, so. <laughs> <laughs> interested to ask you Rick, from a sort of insider industry perspective when you have to go to big meetings at Dreamland and present ideas do you come across challenges in terms of what might be a good idea on the surface that isn't about inclusivity at all? Yeah I think it's it's um I think first of all on the surface of what I've realized when I go to a lot of meetings how different I look to other people <laughs> Uh, you know, and realizing, oh wow, um, there aren't many people that look like me around the table. And then, so you kind of having to combat that. And then it's, um, like you said, when it's kind of putting your ideas across for programs, um, for developing, for, you know, for example, artists. I know that I come from a very different place to a lot of people around that table. And so then, first of all, I think the challenge for me sometimes is myself. <laughs> Because then it means that I'm constantly doubting um, if my uh, opinion approach is worthy of, you know, to have a seat around that table. Firstly, then also, um, I feel like sometimes you feel like you're having to. I don't know how you feel, but having to kind of really give uh, 110 more reasons why, you know, that's a good idea. This is why we should do this. Um, you know, this panel, and I feel sometimes it, it's. Does feel a challenge? It does feel challenging to feel, you know, to feel confident in your in yourself. Yeah. How 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 thank you, Victoria. Um, how about you, Ashita? Do you think you're cutting the mustard? Um, and how does it feel? How, what does what, what does it mean to you? Uh, diversity. And, yeah. Do you know? I know these are really big buzzwords at the moment, like diversity and inclusion. But if I'm totally honest with you, I've been living a diverse life since day one I was born. Like, like that's the best way I can put it. Like, you know, I'm um, South Asian. I'm, um, you know, from the LGBT community. I identify as trans. I'm also disabled, um, Muslim background. So from day one, literally, it, and I'm proud of all my identities. Not at any point in my life have I been ashamed of any of my identities. So for me, diversity and inclusion is never anything new. I've also gone through life, if I, if I don't see myself anywhere, I go out and seek myself. So for example, for years I used to think that I was the only LGBT Muslim. Mm. For years and years and years. And it was only when I was allowed to. So, you know, um, I used to sneak out and go to LGBT venues in Soho and, you know, I would see mostly white LGBT people. But I just knew that surely I'm not the only one. And it's only when I found other people that were from the same sort of ethnic background or religious background or you know gender, sexuality background, that I realized, okay, I'm definitely not the only one. Um, but it, it, we're going through really interesting times when now, all of a sudden, we have this diversity card, we have this inclusion card. And I was having this discussion um, with my flatmate a couple of days ago 
So I put my hand on my heart and I'm so late, but I watched Get Out, that, the horror film, like two days ago. Uh, and I'm, I know I'm like two years too late. But you know the lead actor in it, he's a British guy, uh, he's a British actor who went to America in order to get jobs for black actors that weren't being sort of auditioned for here. And now, all of a sudden, now here, where there's this drive to like really get, you know, Hollywood or British film or, or the arts more di uh, diverse and inclusive. In an essence, like in answer to your question, we're literally, we're not even scratching at the surface. Yeah. We're just like, it's, it's not even the tip of the iceberg, it's just a tap. Yeah. Like there's so much more to do. I mean, if I look at the arts, whether it's broadcasting, whether it's TV, radio, stage, whatever, in terms of diversity, and this isn't just about race, it's all the diversity, including class, including where, um, you know, a lot of the panel before we came on, we were discussing like geographic lottery. Like it all depends where you're born, not just in the world, but also in the UK. If you're born in, say, Margate, for example, I'm not afraid to say this, you've got to work harder than someone who's, say, born in, uh, in London, for example, to get anywhere or get your door within, you know, somewhere within the arts. So we're not even scratching at the surface, personally. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, Roxanne? Of course. Um, yeah, like you said, I think we need to be wary of buzzwords. Um, I feel that what is great about this time is that a lot of dialogue is happening, as we can see here. Um, but I think sometimes we have to be aware of like tokenism um, and people just fulfilling quotas, you know. Um, but what I do feel is very exciting about this time is that a lot of people, um, intersectional people have decided to make their own paths and are creating their own events, their own record labels, um, their own raves, um, to facilitate a safe space for those people. Um, and I believe that's where the real strength will come from because um, there is a wider problem at large that is happening, excuse my voice is going. <clears throat> so, uh, once that changes, once that systematic thing changes, um, it, it won't change within the arts. So there's, there's a wider problem at large happening. But um, thank you, darling. Um, but yeah, I do, I do believe it's an exciting time. I do think that incredible things are happening. For instance, like two of my great friends have started um, this thing called Babes, which is basically for queer women of color. Um, and they have incredible raves, they curate exhibitions, and it's for people that don't really get the spotlight in um, the mainstream, you know, that is generally run by cis white men. Um, so yeah, it, it's a hard one. Um, there's a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. all of them, 12 questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, so this is the thing. So I'm talking about theatres. So there's loads of schemes, which is great. And it's, you know, like how we're marginalised, you know, whatever, whatever the word is this week, um, to get people in. So you get the opportunity, and then you get in. And that's a wonderful, but then you're just like, you're the only one in the room, you're the only one around the table. And so you get there, you fuck up, you know, and you don't know, you don't know what's going on. And you're too, you know, it's, it's imposter syndrome because you are an imposter, you know? So what needs to, I think the next stage of it is that the ones of us who survive that process, like if we then go on and we don't die of exhaustion in like the meantime or of rage, then, <laughs> <laughs> then like, then you get to be there and then you're there sort of when the next people come in. You need, you know, like in, um, like in youth groups, when you've got like a really amazing youth worker, it's always like some fella who's been to prison, isn't it? You know, someone who's lived it. Like they're great, and so that's what we need is like the version of fellas who've been in prison. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then that's, and I think we are heading there. But that, that, that.
that needs to like be acknowledged and happen. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> to be honest, the imposter syndrome is real. It never stops in my experience, which is annoying because I get given more and more opportunities. I work my absolute ass off. I am in a position where my voice is heard. I have a public profile. I won awards. I'm, like, there's loads of amazing accolades, but at the same time, it doesn't stop, unfortunately, because there's not enough representation. There's not enough people like me in the room. When I am saying, you know, Boom Chakalaka, for example, is something that I did out of necessity. Not just as a vanity project, because I felt like saying I've got a production company. I felt compelled to create a platform because I knew how hard it had been for me. And I didn't want to have another white, cisgendered man in charge of my destiny or anyone else that comes up, you know, through and around me. And that's to do with many sorts of people when it comes to class. And, you know, I run it with another woman and we, that's the ethics. Of our, of, you know, to maybe be the, maybe be the youth leaders that have been in prison. <laughs> but let's use that as a metaphor because I've definitely been some kind of um, systemic racist, uh, systemically misogynistic prison. I ain't gonna lie. I've definitely, I know I could talk to you for hours about how that feels. Luckily, my natural personality is to be an optimist and to believe in art and believe in people. And I love telling stories, and I like to surround myself with others that do that in nuanced ways. And that keeps me not dying of rage and exhaustion. But I totally agree with you. And there's a lot of work to do. And collectively, as long as we don't continue on this capitalist path of like, as long as I make all the money, and I have all the Instagram followers, and my business is the success, which I find very boring, if we can have these discussions together and appreciate people's difference, we're getting there. We can get there. Nice feeling. Um, <laughs> I think um, when I when I started out doing what I was doing, uh, I I had no I didn't have any of the perspective obviously that I have now. I just had this raw desperation to make work and try and be heard, etc., etc. Um, I think now the situation that we're in, yes, we have to be wary of tokenism. Yes, when there are other people in the room, these are as you say, like people fresh out of prison now working in youth work, these people, it's a really good analogy because as soon as you come into a room and there is a feeling of recognition or just understanding rather than like patronising, that is the main thing, is the patronising approach of um, people in the arts to any, anybody other. But actually I think that the, the energy of um, willingness to talk about it and willingness to acknowledge that's, for me, it's, it's got to be a positive step. I suppose what's interesting to say is that I found myself in a situation uh, last summer. I've been touring as a musician for fucking years. Like, it's got to be 10, 15 years. I started out, obviously, at, like, like busking and on the bus and everything. And then, I mean, the, the bus is in the, the bus that you get, like, the, like the bus. <laughs> Getting on the bus to go to, um, I don't mean the tour bus, but... <laughs> But we, we ended up, we ended up last summer, you know, we ended up working our way up and we were on a tour bus and had all the crew and all this stuff that I'd never had before and found myself in this situation where I looked around and I was in this, cr this crew, all of the tech team were white, male and straight. And like, within the creative unit, the, it was always important that there was women in the band, women on stage with me, that people were represented, that 
And then suddenly I saw this like this weird thing that had just happened kind of without me realizing that the the production crew had just assembled themselves, kind of I took my eye off the ball. And then I found myself in the position of being the person, being like, wait a minute, this isn't okay, this isn't all right. And then I had to have a conversation with um, my kind of production manager, stop me if this is getting fucking tedious, but it's going somewhere, <laughs> where I, I had to say to him, like, look, this isn't okay. And he's like, I can't find you a female lighting tech. I can't find you a female lighting, lighting tech of color. And I, I can't find you somebody more like you in their sexuality or their gender. I can't find that for you because he didn't know where to look because where in his like immediate surroundings everybody looks like him because that's who goes and does those jobs. It was extremely difficult and heartbreaking to suddenly think that this person who's a close friend of mine, I had to really break it down to him how much he was letting me down by like not even by by not even realizing that that was a fucking tragic thing to even think that for. Do you know what I mean? It's bollocks. Like, what the fuck did he think he was saying? Of course. There's lighting techs everywhere, especially in theatre, actually, like. Uh, so, I, I don't really know if that answers your question, but in the time since I started till now, I'm looking for a female tour manager. <laughs> I've got some skittles in my mouth, but I can cope. I, I suddenly wanted to buy any, even though I was had sweets. Um, so I think, I think, well, it's not a huge answer to that, but something I've been thinking about recently is the way. So this is bad. Um, the way that we go into, or I go into, and I suppose a lot of theatre practitioners do. You go somewhere, you go into some rough space or something, and you go. Uh, it's a poetry workshop, isn't it wonderful? You can express yourself, you're all fucking brilliant. And then you go away and you never see them again. And I start to feel very dodgy that I do that. And it just feels like it needs to be like just a bit more sustainable. Because I feel like I'm going, yeah, I love what you could have won, you know? And this, this could have been your life, but it can't be now because I'm off. So I think that we need to sort that out. And just be, just, I don't know, keep going back. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like that. doing sort of, rather than going, I'm going to save your life, like, you know, let's sit down for the last 10 minutes of it and do like a, you know, a, 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 this is your plan and this is your exit strategies and, you know, like stuff like that, so, and then tell them to go away and do that with a bottle of wine with the mates and a flip chart, you know, like, yeah, just being a bit more realistic and less namby-pamby, mimsy boo. I was going to say, I think parachuting stuff in just doesn't work. What you want is that consistency, and I think um, what I try and do whenever we 
doing sort of educational programs here at Dreamland is showing that 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 story, that narrative of this is what happens. You know, we're going to do a workshop, uh, a poetry workshop, for example. But then, what's the next step? Kind of giving them um, opportunities to see that it, perhaps it goes into education, or if it doesn't go into education, it goes into something else. It's kind of not just coming in and just being like, "We're going to save you." <laughs> it's unrealistic is being able to show those kind of entry points and you know where can you take it from there and i think that's more empowering than just coming in and doing the fun workshop for you know an hour um yeah i totally agree um and the problem is why a lot of these things aren't sustainable is because there isn't funding for it sorry let me let me rephrase that there is funding but it's not going to the right people um you know, I am still very close friends to my music teacher who has been teaching at my school for the past 15 years. And every year she tells me how the funds get cut. And it breaks my heart because the reason I'm in music is because I had incredible teachers who were given funding to teach us and um, make sure that we had a wide range of knowledge, musical knowledge, and that it was fun and that it was educational. Um, and also shown us that music or the arts was a viable career to take. Um, and it pisses me off because like, this government makes so much money from the arts, like billions of pounds, yet they don't want to fund it. Um, so I think that, because it really puts a lot of strain on these people that are starting workshops, that it is grassroots, but they don't have the funding. Um, and you know, some of these, funding councils who will remain nameless will end up giving it to people that actually have the money themselves to, to sustain themselves and these other group, grassroots companies can't survive. So I think a lot more pressure needs to be put on the government to take this very seriously. Um, even if it's not a, a career that people even want to take, I think just for their like mental health and their well-being, that they can express themselves, that and they can feel present, and they can feel seen, find a voice. Um, there's so many different parts to this whole thing, you know. Um, but I still think, yeah, grassroots community is the way forward. There's lots of people doing incredible things, changing people's lives, even if it's just 100 or 200 people. Um, and I think it's having those conversations. Instagram's amazing. The amount of people I found through that who I'm lifelong friends with who have helped me to feel seen, to feel like I'm part of something, even if the powers that be don't recognize that. Um, so yeah, finding your people is essential, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I was gonna say something similar about community in terms of overwhelm. I think once you rip the plaster off and you realize the problem, you know, it's very raw, it's very real, like there is a, a lot, there are a lot of problems, it's very complex, but rather than getting overwhelmed, which is, it can happen, um, I think it's about like looking around what's closest to you and focusing on the people's lives that you can enhance or that you can support. And that is your next door neighbors or your friendship group or your niece or your child, you know, we can help to support particularly the next generation that is close to us and and getting rid of like this kind of ex this excess judgment that we have on how we analyze society and keep keeping on with bringing people, to, go back to bring people together because we can have conversations like this and we can like grapple it out together and I also think that like personally like um, a sort of audit like I do every sort of season or something I don't know you sort of look at and see what you're doing with your energy um, whether it's project based in terms of career wise or it's just like who you're helping or who you're not whatever and just checking in because we've all got to make money to survive but like where are you putting your energy like and maybe balancing out some of the stuff that you feel less comfortable with with something more community based or you know there's different we can interpret that in different ways but constantly kind of riding the seesaw of the bullshit and the real shit is quite good yeah and this is so loaded but also you can touch loads of people that 
So, so uh, I'm a patron of this organisation called Arts Emergency that um, was started because of the emergency in the arts and the lack of, this is about class diversity, but it, it, uh, you know, it's across the board, the, the lack of diversity in the arts. And the idea, the premise of this organisation is to set up an alternative old boys club, is the way that they described it to me when they were talking to me about what it was, whereby you just get involved as an artist practitioner and that you're just, basically you're there to offer a little like step up to somebody trying to get on in the arts. Mm -hmm. Somebody who wouldn't otherwise have that opportunity to have that step up. And it's really cool what they're doing. And it, I feel like that's a really positive and like active way of like just making, just making something happen rather than, um, Rather than like, you know, discussing there's a problem, what I feel is cool about this is it's like, okay, so nobody's gonna solve this for us, so let's just fucking sort it out. And that's what I feel like really excited about. There's also a lot of theatre companies that have got the same motivation. Um, there's a theatre company that I'm close to called Commonwealth, and they're just wicked, they're based up in Bradford, and what they're saying is like, yeah, we, we want to make theatre, we love theatre, we want to make theatre, but that theatre up there, that's not what we think of when we think of it. Like, they don't want us, and actually we don't want to be there. I'm sick of trying to batter down a door to be in a room that I don't want to be in. It's really boring in there. Like, it's, like, it's not for me. So what Commonwealth do is just make fucking incredible work on their own terms with community. And it's just, it's electric, you know? It's a much more electric atmosphere and environment when it feels like propelled by glee and like motivation and audacity rather than um, kind of worthiness, etc. you know? Thank you. And Arts Emergency are coming to Marble. They're opening, I'm not opening, but they're launching in Marble. That's really exciting. Um, uh, uh, what I wanted to take from that is talking about uh, venues and, you know, uh, not just venues, but safe spaces or uh, the bo boring room. There are exciting things going on. How do we make things more accessible in the arts, um, and I suppose reach more, like reach. How do you, how do you how do you reach your crowd, your 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 club nights and your variety the variety that you do? Like how do you is it all through social media? Or how do we how, when you walk into a venue, you know what puts you off, or what in experience do you remember little used? You know when you were little and it was all big and all daunting and all posh and horrible. Um, what can we do? Because I think I, st I think there's still a lot of spaces like that. Even yeah, there's a big woman there. Um, you know, I feel like that a lot of the time. So, uh, 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 and this is for everyone, but I'd like to maybe specifically to your art form. Um, so when I when I first started doing drag, for example, this is just one thing. So when I first started doing drag, for example, I enter the competition, the drag competition, and I don't know about you, but if you're gonna enter a competition, you wanna win. As I entered the Twins, I was like, okay, what can set me apart? And I, I decided to go on wearing like a black burqa and talking about like, you know, being a Muslim, being British, and I, I basically, do you know that aqua song, I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world? I sang it, I'm a Punjabi girl in a Punjabi world. And basically, I just, I sort of put on stage what, I was, in a way, because I wasn't seeing myself anywhere. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna win this competition, I'm gonna be myself, blah, 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 blah. I went into this competition and all hell broke, all hell broke loose because the audience were like, okay, is this offensive? Is this not offensive? 
is this right, isn't it right, you know. Um, and I had grown up for years watching drag queens like tear apart like sister act, um, nuns outfits, like you name it, all sorts of religious things. But when I went on in a burger, it was like such a big deal. Um, so I guess going back to your um, question, there are still there are still venues or places where it's so daunting being yourself. Now, what I always do is, for me personally, it was really important to be visible, but also to kind of have discussions around pride within yourself. And that's easier said than done. It's taken me years and years. I'm 35 now. I started like doing drag when I was like 25. So I've been doing it now for like 10 years. And I started transitioning like two years ago. So it's, it's been a massive journey. But in order to sort of create all those safe spaces or to sort of see myself there, um, sort of see, see you know, um, sorry, let me say that again. In order to create the safe spaces where I can see myself and everyone else, I had to first be visible. And I know not everyone is going to do that, not everyone should. I, there are safety elements sometimes involved. And, but I do believe that because we live in a country and in an era where you know, we've got social media to our advantage. I used it to my advantage. I used YouTube to my advantage. I used, um, you know, BBC Channel 4, everything to my advantage in order to get this point out there that, look, there are so many other people that are under the radar that are living all around you that you don't know about. And don't just pigeonhole them into just black or Asian or lesbian or gay. Actually, there's, you can have one person who can be disabled, gay, It isn't just about tick, like separating the, separating those boxes. Actually, one person can have all those boxes. So, yeah, I don't know if that does answer your question, but it's sort of, you know, you kind of have to, and sort of going back to the previous question about what, you know, what we can do to get out there to young people. What I would say is actually, it's kind of linking back to self-esteem and pride, is that if you can, if we can get young people to believe that you are the master of your own destiny and you can use your telephones and internet and all these platforms to bring your art out, then you've won. Because when I was a teenager, the only thing that was sort of coming from the background that I come from, the arts was like, my mum and dad were, no, 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 you must be a you know doctor and all, or all this thing or you know, you must do something that brings in a safe amount of money every month. You can't go into the arts, because it's, you know, and it's still that point that arts is not, you know, lucrative or, you know, and money aside, I mean, it's all about happiness. But back then it was all about, if you can get to stage school, you've made it, because then you can get yourself an agent and blah, 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 blah. Mm. But now actually, you can be the master of your own destiny by just putting and obviously in a safe space, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Instagram, whether it's whatever, is if we can, it's about using our creativity to think of other creative ideas. You know, in a, in a world where funding is becoming smaller and smaller and opportunity is coming low, actually use your own platform to make your own platform. So I hope that answers your question. Sometimes you're not always going to get it right, and I find that sometimes we, we're always fearful of making mistakes. And I think if we become comfortable as a venue or as, or as, a, as a, a safe space, or, or it's okay to make a mistake and for us to have that discussion. So if people are saying, "Hey, actually, you don't feel like your program is diverse enough," that's okay for us for us to have that conversation. I think they, you know, both the audiences and the venue owners need to feel comfortable to have that, that, um, that conversation.
conversation, so then he's not getting defensive um, when you know they're being said. Well, actually, well, actually, it feels like you haven't had you know enough females throughout the program of the year. Then we need to be able to, as a venue, be confident to have that discussion. And I think it's being really open. And I love um, you know opportunities that different venues have. For example, Big Ben King Art Thirty One, where they're really involving young people in making some of those decisions about programming and how they can make sure their program is diverse, uh, you know, is, you know, is uh, representing many different people. So I think it's um, very much the responsibility for the venue to be really open and for us to also be like, I think a lot of people sometimes would like to have a mind that we don't necessarily go to the source. It's like, let's actually create opportunities for the venue for people to get involved so they can actually, you know, say, Think we need more people doing, you know, we need, we need uh, a variety of different people, a variety of different, um, you know, different types of performance, music, theatre, you know, even this tonight is very different to what we normally have here and it feels great to have something different. So I think when those things happen and we enjoy them, we should be talking about them and being really positive and like, actually this works, we want more of this. And in the same breath, if we feel like we're not getting the things that we need, from a program, from a you know, from a, an organisation, a venue, then again we should be, you know, knocking on that door and saying, come on, we, you know, we want some change. But I think it's important to be positive as well. So when they do, when we do get it right, we need to be talking about it. When you know, when you know, a, a theatre or a venue gets it right, we need to be, you know, singing their praises and. Uh, yeah, we like to know. Is Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, I'll be brief. <laughs> so, um, theatres need to stop just advertising in their own foyers. Um, and if you are going around, um, say, uh, a, a B I know I've mentioned BSL a few times, but if you're going to have BSL, you need to go out and find deaf audiences because they don't trust us. Um, and rightly so. So you need to, yeah, you just need to go out and find audiences, whether that's in the chippy or whether that's in the hospital or wherever. I think that marketing is that's important. That was brief, guys. Um, yeah, I think for true diversity to happen, we need to make sure that um, the positions of power have people that are diverse. Um, I perform at a lot of um, institutions, and what's been amazing is to see people of colour that have been, um, now have the roles of programmers. So because of that, they're putting on events um, which are relative and are diverse um, and are representative. So I think, yeah, um, people need to have those positions of power in order for those things to be shown. Um, otherwise, it goes back to what I said before, it's tokenism, there's no longevity and it's not sustainable and it doesn't happen more than once. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's okay, cool. Um, save you from that sentence. <laughs> um, one tiny, it's not a massive answer, but one tiny little thing, because I get books for, because I'm the one leg of power, and so I get books for diversity shit all the time on the leg thing, and so I do like, like two, I do two leg gags, and then I'll wank on about class for, eight, for ages, and they, so I think, you know, mess with them. <laughs> really good point as well. I mean, I'm not
nodding at everything, I agree with absolutely everything. I think you're all amazing. I think everyone like, you know, that's engaged in this conversation is mostly on a path of being a bit amazing. But um, I think being humble about how you find the audience is, is really important and not just assuming that because the conversation has begun and because we are woke or we have come to these conclusions that everybody else can. I think we need to be really honest about that in terms of, you know, I, I think that this conversation should happen once a month in, the, in a bigger room and it just gets, becomes, the momentum gets bigger and bigger and how we go about that equals some serious hard graft. Like, to be able to engage audiences that are not feeling like they deserve to be in this room beyond how we feel, you know, talking about, if you're talking about really marginalized people, you have to <laughs> go out and like you say, like speak to people and, and make people feel that they are welcome and invited regardless of what their background or their ethnicity is. And I think we've kind of, in, in the arts or maybe as society, kind of forgotten like how important like that kind of face-to-face -face realism, like that honest, Oh, you're a bit different. Like we, we. You, it's, it's like, oh, it's like, nah. Like we've all just got to like, work this out. <laughs> we have to work it out. And another thing I was thinking about is representing whatever the diverse kind of the like the minority is, and it's very broad in a really nuanced way. Like I was thinking about the Desmonds. Like I'm obsessed with watching Desmonds on uh, Channel Four Catch Up. <laughs> the best. Um, not only because I'm absolutely obsessed with nostalgia, because I think that in some ways we kind of got this stuff a little bit better for a small chink in the optimistic 90s New Labour optimism, but fuck it. But like, I like, like the fact that black people in South London are represented in a, you know, different sorts of people <laughs> represented on screen. It's fun, it's like, it's comedic, there's a sense of humour that's seriously important, it represents sometimes quite serious stuff. Even though you wouldn't expect that when you think about the Desmonds. Um, you've got, you know, Caribbean people taking the mickey out of people from Africa. Like, you know, it's just, it's like black people are, of course, different. <laughs> different ages, different races, right? And I'm, I'm a little bit sick of, okay, talking about commissioning as an example, but this happens everywhere, uh, particularly in the media, in the way that, again, minorities are depicted. And like, oh, well, of course we don't, we're not gonna do another black comedy because we've got one. Or, uh, let's look at this cast, like, there's a, there is, like, the gay best friend. Like, come on, like, we're all different. I think, I just, I just wanted to say that, I think as you said, Roxanne, like, that if the positions of power change, then there's a more implicit trust that will develop because it will just feel more natural when you get a booking or you'll feel like you've got more common ground. And so the, I think that's a really good point about what you're saying. Like once, once the people that are doing the bookings are coming from a place of just more understanding, then there's a, we will feel it. The people that are getting booked will feel that and you respond to that in kind. You turn up and you do a better show. You feel it when you walk in the room, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, like even just this evening, like when you holler at, people and say do you want to come and do this thing like you just people are like yeah that'll be that feels like it's going to be on a level yeah. well do you know what I mean and I, th I think that that's it's important to just acknowledge that here in this big venue space where there's stuff you know potentially going on yeah it's a step in the right direction I think so it's just worth like down the way, won't name it, and um, I'm constantly greeted with seemingly the cheerful consumers who make me want to bang my head against the wall. But on the flip side, I've got these like 11, 12, 13 year old kids that are literally like, 
oh yeah, it's an easy my letters, Liz. Don't worry, I can't do my nan, but I'll be out in 19, it's fine, and this and this and this. Oh, put it but better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, basically, school's oppressive, teachers are annoying, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> can't deal with any of it. But the kids are phenomenal, and they tell me these stories, and their parents are not very helpful, their surroundings are not very helpful, and where they get this like, power from and beliefs, it literally just comes out of them like, it's nothing, and they'll just see me for 10 minutes in the morning and tell me about coming out the day before and it wasn't that great, but it's fine. Or whatever they're identifying as they're going through. And they get that bravery from the internet and from people like you. So first off, like, kudos, hats off, because it only comes from people like you putting creative things out there that they can get in their room or on their phone. Like, it's amazing. Um, my question is, a couple of funny things happened today. So, I always think Pal needs to get in school, like everything that is in the programme. So I took a load of programmes in school, spoke to my like, head of department, brought these in, gonna put them on reception, put them out to the kids, and I just got this weird look, like, I'm not sure that's gonna be all right. And I was like, you're telling me the school is now against empowering women, like just women. She's like, oh, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I was like, what if I put them in a staff room? Ridiculous, right? Absolutely ridiculous. On the flip side, I gave one brochure to a head of English, told them about you lot, and they were like, oh my God, can we get any free energy content at school? So like, these two things happen within an hour of each other. So I guess my question is, when it's that crazy, but there are people in the school and there are captive audiences of children that want it, could you and should you be going straight into these big schools where there's opportunity and what could you do if you did that? The answer is I think absolutely yes, but the system doesn't allow for that, as you just said. If you're not allowed to put out a programme, and also it needs to be done with like a collective. Do you know what I mean? It's not just one person on the panels. Like it's got to be like how does how you know as a collective integrate into schools like on a, in a way that it's going to work institutionally. But I think the answer is, of course, that needs, yes, but it needs to be supported. Like when I wrote my book, I tried my hardest to get like the Ministry of Education to like speak to me. Did they want to speak to me? No. I went to schools in the yellow bus instead, but it was hard. <laughs> Only because I was on Radio 1 I was allowed in. <laughs> Otherwise, who's this crazy woman on a yellow bus? <laughs> Quite crazy. <laughs> I just, um, I'm just curious to ask, because I feel like you guys have a lot more experience um, than me, and as a woman in the industry, and I just really want to, I'm like really at the beginning, and I feel like there's a lot that's about to happen, and I just really want to ask, how do you protect yourself? Because there's obviously a part of us that wants to better the world around us, but that um, involves a lot of labour, emotional labour, and I guess what I'm trying to say is like, for you guys coming up, you were starting a conversation. I feel like now that I'm starting, I'm going to be, or lots of the people around me are going to be pushed into the conversation, because you have to be part of the conversation. Not that I don't want to be part of the conversation or that people, I feel like there is a lot of trauma that you are unpicking by forcing the conversation before something's ready because I don't feel like I'm mature enough to partake. Not that I'm not, I don't have anything to contribute, but I don't feel like, you know when your idea has ripened, I feel like the idea has just begun and you need experience in order to like really make it weighty, how do you protect yourself in an environment where people are constantly forcing you, not forcing you, but thinking that you have the answer and are trying to yank it out of you before you're ready to even give one? First of all, thank you for being so brave to like ask that question. I don't think I could ask that question even, even now sometimes. I think you said it, actually, even in your question. It's how you protect yourself is by doing stuff when you feel ready to do it. 
you are in charge of, of you. So that's the first thing I'll say. And the second thing is when you do decide to go on your creative journey, set out things for self-care. So, for example, these are small things that I do every day or a few times a week just to, just to get back to that space of just me. Not me, the artist, not me, the public figure, not me on YouTube, just me. And it's, this is going to be different for each and every one of you all and everyone on the panel. What I do is I make sure I get enough sleep. I make sure that I'm eating things that I like. Sometimes not always very good, but just stuff that you like to eat. I mean, when I started hormones, one thing that I did not get is why girls put on, like, find it, like, weight fluctuating all the time. And when I started hormones, my God, my weight would go up and down all the time, and it still does. And I'm trying really hard to, like, suck in my stomach right now. But um, eat stuff that you want to eat, because it, hormonally, like, that really helps all women. Um... And the other stuff that I do is I do face masks and hair masks at least once a week. Like, I go down to the control. You know those cucumber 99p masks? <laughs> Literally, I just do that because it allows me just to take half an hour out of a busy schedule <coughs> just for myself. And it's just about finding mechanisms for yourself as an artist to find things to help yourself take care of yourself before you even decide to go on that journey. And even during on that journey, you'll need time for yourself. So self-care is priority. Kate Bush never did interviews. Right. You don't have to explain yourself, Tom, to piss off. Like, just like the word. Like, you don't have to do this. <laughs> that I thought your song at the beginning of performance, I thought it was beautiful. I thought I felt really lucky to have heard that. And um, I just, I feel like it's important to say that as you go into this industry, making music, what happens is everybody, everybody in that industry and in, in the industry of selling a musician and making a musician somebody who people have heard of, they all want to describe you, who you are, that's part of what they do. Some person who isn't you will begin to live as you in other people's imaginations. And so at a time when you're still trying to work out who you are, where you're coming from, what your music, where, where that comes from, where it could go, it can be extremely dangerous to have this kind of volatile relationship with what other people are imagining of what your capabilities are. So even just being aware that it's, it's completely unreal, this idea of being defined by anything other than where you're at in the moment. Like it, and what you make today, and what you make next week, and what you make two years down the line, that should be the definition of like, okay, this is where I'm at, this is the process I'm in, this is where my music's going. And the rest of it, like, yeah, it's a beautiful thing to say, Kate Bush never did interviews, but you got to do them. Like, you, I mean, may, maybe you don't have to do them, but like, she, Exactly this, like, and like, fucking hell, you know, they're horrible things to do, but at the same time, like, if we're, we're talking about being visible and, and making a kind of, making something happen for people that are looking, looking at you, hearing you, and, be, and suddenly in their own mind, something happens in somebody else, because they're like, wow, you went there, you, you said something, you sang something, and it, and it brings me closer to something in myself that wasn't happening until I saw you do that performance, or I read that thing, or whatever it was. So in some ways, if you're going to put yourself out there, then you want to be as out there as possible. Otherwise, what are you doing it for? You're trying to, you're trying to reach. There's a, there's a connectivity to, to art that is very important. So I would just say that it is fucking horrible. It's horrible to, to the, the practicality of getting it done. But to keep the end goal in sight at all times and to just remember, like, everything else will melt away. But the, the impact that you may possibly have on somebody's life, that's the burning ambition, that's the higher calling. This is it, you're in pursuit of a, of a more important thing. And that will give you mad strength. And you've already got it anyway because you even had the intention to ask the question. So you're going to be all right.
it very important, actually. I think it was very important for me to hear that, because it's very true. Um, also, the importance of fun. Yes. Oh my God. Can we all just like have a laugh? <laughs> and like, we, whatever that means, whatever that, whatever that means, like wearing multi coloured eyeshadow, which it is for me, or, or the <coughs> self care of like the, the face mask and not taking it all too seriously sometimes is really. Because I think a lot, of, a lot of the heroic moments within the discussion we've had have been funny or beautiful and real and human. And th you, you should have so much fun. <laughs> I think also um, to be unapologetic, you know, take up space, yeah. you know, don't yeah. put down your shoulders, don't hide, be you, yeah. um, there's, you know, I, I love Joe Bill, I'm like her number one fan, um, and the reason I was so instantly gravitated towards this, sorry I'm making this about you, sorry it's too, too much, <laughs> but it's because, um, yeah, on Instagram, I saw this beautiful, dark-skinned woman of colour playing the guitar and playing her own songs. And for so long, the narrative has been, you know, black people sing soul, black people sing R&B, black people do rap, black people do grime. Um, and anything slightly alternative is just kind of not really understood, like you can't be weird. But I saw this beautiful, dark-skinned black girl doing weird music on her own terms. And for me, that has been defiant. That is being unapologetic, that is creating your own path, and that's having your own voice through your music, and that is more than enough. More than enough. So. And I think it should appeal to everyone, like, you know, like, it's not, it's all of us. And sticking with people that make you feel like that, and if they don't, they can literally get lost. Like, <laughs> what's the point? <laughs> yeah. stick, like, stick with the people that give you these things, if it's empowerment, whether it's fun, whether it's mentorship. Like, do, we gotta do it, we got like, if they, if they don't like it, bye. <laughs> 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 Join Cal, we're going to play you out with uh, some poetry and then we're going to watch a film. Um, so, uh, uh, one last time, the rest of the panel, uh, you can, we're gonna, in, uh, uh, here we go, lost speech, no speech. Uh, give it up for Jackie Hagen. <laughs> tells me that I could be a Paralympian. <laughs> I mean, so you could be an Olympian, couldn't you? And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to do a poem, and it's, um, I used to be shit at life, and then when I was in hospital, I was in hospital for five months, having my leg off, it was all, you know. And um, there, was, there was two women that were kind of, um, like, integral to my, my maturity at the time. One of them was Barbara, who was the nurse, who had a face like a hen party. And... <laughs> The other one was Edna. Now, Edna was 73. She was in the next bed to me for five months, and she looked like a threadbare tennis ball with eyes. And she, and she hated, uh, she hated scousers, uh, manx, tea, coffee, swearing, toddlers, wisdom, jumble sales, my tattoos, my hair, me, my face. <laughs> And above all, nurses, 
Now, so I fucking love her. I can imagine her in leather, you know, if she balls. Um, so um, this is um, this poem is dedicated to Edna wherever she is now, and it's a, a list of things to get me from one end of the day to the other, and it's called "You Can't See Through Another Man's Eyelids." One. Don't cut off your face to spite someone else's face. Two. Don't cut off your face. <laughs> Three. A blood sweet pause in someone else's mouth doesn't necessarily mean it's time for you to speak. Four. You're probably not as ugly as you think you are. You are a generous buffet of crisps. <laughs> Five. The minimum fill line on a kettle is real. <laughs> Six, don't be mean to fumble on people, though whatever they put into punchlines, people can fly when you don't make them feel self-conscious about it. Seven, romanticize the repetitive clunk. Eight, give your pets a heroic aura. Nine, I come from a town where the barmaids have tits and the fellas are homophobic, but in a nice way, Your weirs and your shorts and your man tells me you're gay, but I knew your dad and he was witty and so are you. You're all right, you love your aunt. Weird hair. <laughs> Ten. If you're working class, you inherit anger. If you're middle class, you inherit manners. And a fucking big elves. <laughs> oh, not any fucking more, Jesus Christ. I get told that a lot outside. The middle classes are not inheriting houses anymore, and apparently it's my fault. Uh, <laughs> 11. The fight for sexual equality is not between men and women, it's between people and dickheads. <laughs> <laughs> including Kate Moss, 13. <laughs> 13. On March the 13th, 2013, the nurse said to me, your stump is a funny shape. Do you want to look at it? <laughs> You're all right, mate, there. I've just had me tea. And then she left me alone with it for the first time. You know uh, the blonde one out of Birds of a Feather? <laughs> Looks like a miserable dog. <laughs> Could hide it away, that's what you're meant to do with ugly stuff that people are going to judge you on. Could do that. Um, oh. Stump puppetry, all right. <laughs> She's a hard sell, and then she does this shit. <laughs> I like Billy Elliot the musical. Um, so what I do now is I go around primary schools equally inspiring. Um, I'm, I'm fucking kids up. Um, <laughs> and now, if I, if I had a pint, has anyone got secret booze in the audience? <laughs> Can I have some of it, please? Oh, no, you were just whooping for the idea of it. <laughs> okay, well, at this point, I would down a pint out of my leg, but we're not going to do that. Um, but later, mine's cheap shite white wine. Um, so what I do now when things get hard is I think of things in my head that I'm grateful for. Scousers, manics, tea, coffee, swearing, toddlers, wisdom, jumble sales, my tattoos, my hair, my face, me, and above all, nurses. Cheers.
Hopkins. Red 
red morning. Blood on the tips of the thorns and the awning is dripping with all of our scorn because we were born in days that will fill you with porn and with boredom while the grey little faces march in the squadrons to war songs penned by cynical fiends. The latest big hit to cement the routine. Ah, oh, sell us the download and kill all our dreams. She rises. She will see through the disguises. They stab knives in her thighs. See the swell of her iris, she survives. She will run till the cities are vanquished and all of the children are gods again. <laughs> Uh...